I'm preparing to leave. Oh, there we go. I can hear that echo. I'm preparing to leave. And I just wanted to say some words of gratitude. So first of all, guys, thank you for being so welcoming to me. Uh, there's not been a time where I felt like an outsider here. And that's saying something given that I only knew three members of the church before coming, all of whom were family. So they kind of had to like me, you know? Uh, that's fair enough. Further, thank you for embodying sincerity in community. This church is not one that leans away from the tough parts of faithfulness and justice and has refreshed me remarkably so. Lastly, I want to say thank you to the staff team and to you for giving me the chance to speak from scripture and from my heart. Preaching is a joy of mine, but to open up the pulpit to a 23-year-old you hardly know and trust he's not going to go off the rails and rant about an ex-girlfriend or radical politics or cocaine or whatever is evidence of faith in and of itself. Thank you, church. Truly. The last point of gratitude actually segues well into the sermon today. As a kind of sending gift, Tara gave me the go-ahead to preach on whatever topic or passage I want, and then she left. <laughs> Which is, I don't think, a coincidence. Uh, so after great deliberation, fasting, and prayer, I'm going to be preaching from the book of biblical erotic poetry, Song of Songs, for a couple hours today. Lean in. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I have something a little bit different planned for today. Uh... I want to talk about a part of the faithful life that's rarely mentioned, especially in church, but is nevertheless important. I'm going to talk about the silence of God. Friends, how can we expect to live a faithful life until we know what that life will entail, including the bad? Let me illustrate this uh, with a different topic. When I was an undergraduate studying ministry, I was lamenting my own capacity for personal failure to my grandpa who had been in ministry for nearly 60 years at the time. We were driving and he looked at me and he said, Spencer, the faithful life includes failure. The faithful life and the perfect life are not the same thing. That doesn't mean you go out and do whatever you want, but you can be a little bit easier on yourself when you make a mistake. The faithful life includes failure. By reforming my expectations to be realistic and healthy, my grandpa gave me the space to live a Christian life that wasn't racked with constant shame and frustration. By creating some space for me to be honest about what the faithful life looked like, I was able to finally start living it. That's my goal today. I want to create some healthy space acknowledging that the faithful life includes seasons of the silence of God. And the sermon will have three general movements. I'll begin sketching what I understand to be a shallow understanding of how God works with us. And then I'll move and, and look at three different scripture passages that, that I think really give some language to this experience. Right in the Holy Text, right in the Bible. And then I'm going to close by making some space of, for imagination. I don't want to only argue that there's room for the silence, the silence of God in the faithful life. But also I want to imagine how we can possibly respond in our life to that silence constructively and maybe even beautifully. Now, before beginning today, I want to quickly name something. Uh, silence is really difficult for everyone, especially for people who have experienced real trauma. And so you have my word that if we do any practices of silence today, they're going to be all under a minute. They're going to be really quick. All right. Uh, I believe that we're able to do practices together um, without isolating people and without we can hold different spaces for different experiences today. So if I you know, say we're going to sit in silence for a moment, Trust me, it's not going to be for long. You have my word. All right, so we're going to pray, and I'm going to invite a little bit of silence, and then we're going to begin the sermon. Sound good? Bow your heads with me if you'd like. Dear God, I, on this last Sunday of mine here, and as this beautiful morning begins, and as we lean into a pretty difficult and often ignored topic of faith, I pray that you allow yourself to move through my words, even if I'm saying something that may be new or maybe a little scary. And I pray that by hearing someone else say, I've experienced that too, that you free people from some of the guilt and shame that can creep into church communities. Speak to us now. 
Amen. All right, friends. I want to just create a little space for silence. If you want to close your eyes, you can. You don't have to. Um, just, just listen. Not for you know some words in the silence. Not, not some message. Just listen to the silence itself. If you can. Just create a little space. So growing up, I was taught that God was a personal God who wanted to talk to me. I was taught that God talked through three major ways, scripture, prayer, and church, especially tithing. Now, there wasn't given to me in a pamphlet or something. I just picked it up from the stories that were being told around me. I'm convinced that most of our worldviews are formed this way. I just constantly heard stories of powerful experiences during worship or members of the church who read like 10 chapters of the Bible a day, which to me felt like reading the dictionary in a day at the time. Or times where people would pray for four hours straight or moments when half the building got saved or resaved at the altar. These stories informed how I understood God interacted with people, how God was supposed to speak to me. And when you add that to the fact that God was a personal being who loved me, I could assume that God wanted to talk to me too. From this, the formula became quite simple. Read your Bible, pray, go to church, and then God will speak to you. It's that simple. I understood the game and began trying my hardest to read my Bible every night, write regularly in a prayer journal. Like not even just praying out loud, I'm writing this stuff down, like I'm next level. And go to church every church service I could. Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know? And sometimes I did feel like God spoke directly to me. But there were also so many times when I didn't. In fact, there were many times where I felt nothing at all, where I heard nothing at all. Now, within my earlier mindset, there was also one clear circumstance where God would choose not to speak to you. If you were resisting God in some way, sin, unbelief, etc., that was the only possible reason for God's silence. And this is where the problem lied. Even though I was trying my darndest to pursue God with everything I had, when God was silent, there was obviously only one person to blame, and that was me. There must be something wrong with me deep down. There must be some hidden sin that I hadn't confessed yet which led to some blanket confessions, you know? Like, Lord, forgive me of every sin, past and future, even those moments I'm not quite sure if they were sin or not, but like, I wanna confess those too. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there simply had to be something wrong with me. And it wasn't only that God wasn't speaking to me, it seemed like God didn't even want to speak to me. You see the move? It's subtle. So what happened is I would pray more and read my Bible more and worship more and confess more because then surely God would speak. All I had to do was do more, right? And here's the question. Does it sound like a loving God? Does a mother give a note to her son which reads, I will only speak to you after you do all your chores, finish your homework, and make me dinner. Something was wrong with my worldview. Something was wrong with what I thought was included within the faithful life. Something had to change. And for me, it took mentors and loved ones who were honest about their own long, long seasons in the spiritual desert to give myself permission to believe that God's absence wasn't exclusively my fault. And when I returned to the Bible with wider eyes and greater courage, I realized that my earlier theory about how God speaks to us was so oversimplified, it almost completely missed the mark. In fact, God's silence appears in the Bible quite a bit, and it's the Bible. And I think it's worthwhile to look at a few of those moments. So let's engage with three. First, let's look at a man whose name is Job. In the book of Job, a righteous man 
is afflicted by great devastation, supposedly directly from the hand of God. And then Job defends himself from friends who all blame the suffering on him. Surely he must have done something wrong. Sound familiar? Job begs God to answer him. Job is not just afflicted by circumstance, he's afflicted by the silence of God. The book is filled with chapter after chapter after dialogue and lament, all centered around human suffering and the seeming absence of God. It's messy and difficult, but it all demonstrates what the faithful life looks like sometimes. Lament, anger, frustration, all to the face of God, who's nowhere to be seen. Unfortunately, the story is more often than not boiled down to a shallow reading that goes something like this. There was a really good man who loved God a lot and had a lot of kids and stuff. God took away all his kids and stuff. Job was still faithful, though really sad. Blah, blah, blah. Then God spoke to Job and vindicated him in front of his friends. Blah, blah, blah. And gave him back even more stuff and even more kids. Moral of the story. Whatever you're suffering, don't worry. Eventually, if you're faithful, you'll get more stuff and more kids. Because that's what faith results in, right? More stuff, more things. How American, right? How materialistic, how shallow. When I grew up a little, I rejected such a superficial understanding of the book. I was educated. But I still read every verse with the ending in mind. Every time Job lamented God's absence, or talked about the, the suffering he encountered, I think to myself really subtly, oh, just you wait, buddy. Your blessing's coming. It's all gonna work out. I refuse to lean into the fact that Job didn't know how the story would end. And I did this because at the time, I was too scared to acknowledge that I don't know exactly how the story of my life will end. It was because of comfort. Today, I don't read like that either. Instead, I try as best I can to journey alongside Job, this remarkably faithful person. Remember, he's faithful as he anguishes. Job doesn't know how the story ends, and we should follow suit, which removes the control we have as readers because of our outside perspective. It reminds us how little control we have sometimes in this life, and it makes Job's words far more difficult, far more human, and paradoxically, far more faithful. For instance, when Job says in chapter 9, verse 32, God is not a mortal like me, so I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. He's openly admitting that in the moments he aches to talk with God, God doesn't seem like he's there. God's not saying anything back. His prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Or when Job says in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. He again is pleading with God to speak. He's suffering and living a faithful life and experiencing the silence of God. His words intersperse nearly 35 chapters. I do understand that at the end of the book, God does speak to him. But if you actually sit in those chapters without just cheating and going prematurely to the end, it paints a very different picture of what the faithful life can look like sometimes. Because remember, Job was like a varsity level God follower and even he has these experiences, right? And if he has these experiences, what does that say about us if we have them too? All right, let's turn to another, Psalm 88. The book of Psalms is the hymn book of the Bible. It orients the emotional world of the faithful followers of God, capturing moments of praise and lament and joy and frustration and hope. Being a hymn book and all, one would think that the curators of the Psalms would focus on those happier, more praiseworthy moments. You know, more smoke machines, more high, you know, major chords, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But in this book, we find Psalm chapter 88. I'm only going to read a few verses from it, but check this out. This is in your Bible. Verse 6. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Verse 9. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. 
14. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? 18. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. That's how it ends. Darkness is my closest friend. Now, what would you do if Nat got up on stage and started singing something like that? Would you get a little shifty? It sounds more like a Simon and Garfunkel riff than David with his harp. Yes, I'm 23 and I can still make a good Simon and Garfunkel joke. If the Psalms, which have been read by the faithful for 2,500 years or more, make space for these experiences, Lord, why do you reject me? Might it be possible that we can make space within our understanding of the faithful life too? All right, one last passage, this time from the New Testament. Let's look at another person who's typically understood as embodying faithfulness, you know, Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, while Jesus is dying on the cross, he shouts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In one of the most perplexing passages in all of the Bible, Jesus is lamenting the absence of God the Father, which is bizarre because both Jesus and the Father are bound together as one with the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. And yet, even the most faithful person who has ever walked this planet, who has a special connectedness to the Father, still experience the absence of the Father. Strangely, even God experienced the silence of God. Now, once you open yourself to the possibility of this, you see this theme all over the Bible. And don't get me wrong, right? I'm not like up here advocating for this. I understand what I'm saying is heavy. It's not like this is like a Silence of God infomercial for three payments of 19.9. No, no. I'm simply saying that it's part of the faithful life. I'm simply saying that this happens. And it's not even me saying it. It's the Bible. And friends, if you're in a season of, you know, a lot of abundance, this may seem like a downer message, and I'm really sorry about that. But if you've ever experienced a season that has not been that, these words comfort, as strange as they do. They say you're not alone. And right now, if, if you're in a season where you've pursued God and still felt like God was distant, I want you to know that's not necessarily your fault. Our scripture says that. The silence of God is a part of the faithful life. As hard as that is to admit sometimes. All right, so far I've been trying to make the case for God's silence in the faithful life. But as I move toward the end of the sermon, I want to move beyond that general claim and explore how we are to interact with that. Now to be very clear, I'm not interested in finding the lesson behind these things. There's too much mystery in God and in the world for any perfect answer to be given to them. And our experiences are unique. Further, I think responses that too quickly look for a lesson ignore how excruciating it is when we feel like all your prayers are just kind of fading off into the ether. So these three reflections are not say all end all truths. Instead, they are meant to be more like possible frameworks for living well in the face of God's silence. These are not explanations of why God doesn't always feel near, feel near. If I could answer that question, I would not be interning at a small church. I'd be sitting in a corner office. These are responses to the fact that that can still lead to wholeness in those seasons. First, I think that God's silence can force us to rely on community on the church. Experiencing absence can show us our need for each other, which can push us deeper into our community. And God is decidedly uninterested in any kind of westernized, individualistic Christianity, just me and Jesus. Not interested in that. And this provides us the opportunity to rely on each other. We need each other. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I've had to rely on mentors and friends because of seasons like this. When I experience this loneliness, I look to my community. And friends, look around. There are people here who will be for you. And 
don't think that's a bad thing. Oh, it is scary. Second, I think that the silence of God can open us up to other avenues of experience in God we wouldn't have been open to otherwise. As I grew through undergraduate college, I still place God in a pretty small box. Worship, prayer, church, scripture. But the more and more difficulty I encountered, the more and more willing, really desperate, I was to experience God in atypical places. So I discovered nature. It's a crazy thing, you should try it sometime. I discovered poetry. I started seeing God in non-Christian people, who, by the way, according to scripture, are also made in the image of God. Because those traditional moments of access had been removed from me, I was forced to look for God in broader and more beautiful ways. Because God removed God's self, I experienced more of God. Third, God's quietness can force us to trust ourselves as we grow as people. I don't think I'm the only person who has asked God to make most of my hard decisions for me. Like what job I should get, who I should marry, if I get married at all. Like, you know, just help me out here. Because it takes the pressure off, right? And here's the thing though, I don't think God's interested in making all our decisions for us. God is interested in seeing us grow into mature moral beings who make our own decisions in community, which requires us to trust, requires that God trust us enough to make our own decisions sometimes in faith. I mean, just imagine waking up every morning and praying, all right, God, do I wear the shorts or the pants? Do I wear the gray t-shirt or the yellow blouse? As you can tell, I went with the gray t-shirt and the shorts. Sometimes the silence of God forces us to trust our own God-given ability to discern in community what is right and what is wrong and then act accordingly. Now, if you're paying attention, you've noticed that I keep saying the word can and not will. And that's true. We have the choice to respond to God's silence in these ways, but they are by no means necessary outcomes. You have the ability to create meaning out of these experiences or reject meaning entirely, which is a beautiful and terrifying privilege. Friends, the faithful life includes the silence of God. And if today you are wondering where God is, worrying if there is something inherently wrong with you, I want to say very clearly that there is space for you here. You are not innately undesirable. You receive that? There's space for you here. There's space for that in Christianity. If I've learned anything this summer, North Point is a place where you can be honest about that fact and join fellow pilgrims who are also trying to find their way to wholeness, sowing peace and justice, hopefully, along the way. And also, the silence need not be feared. Yes, it can feel like a burden. It is a burden sometimes. Trust me, friends. I know. Trust me. But it can also be a gift. Opening up, opening us up to a world far grander than we ever could have thought. As the contemporary priest and spiritual writer Thomas Keating has famously said, God's first language is silence. Everything else is poor translation. Before worship and ministry time, and as Nat and the band come forward, I wanna close my time here this summer with a sending thought that has lingered behind every sermon I've preached here, especially the sermon today. Friends, this life is brim filled with mystery, resulting in more uncertainty than I care to admit sometimes. But to live in and move through that uncertainty is what faith is. Faith does not remove uncertainty. It helps us navigate it with grace. This world is beautiful and deeply confounding, oppressive and hopeful, silent and overfilled with the presence of God. And it is this world that God has called us into. 
It is this world that God has chosen to love. Instead of setting up three questions and leading into some written exercise or whatever, I think the only proper way to close is with a poem that embodies the wonder of this strange world. So let's be led out by the late illustrious poet, Mary Oliver. I'm gonna read a poem and I'm gonna invite Michelle for ministry time right after. And uh, we'll go from there. Lean into these words, eavesdrop the mystery, listen for the silence. This is a poem called The Summer Day. The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is your plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Let's pray. Lord, speak to us. Such a strange message, something that is so often ignored. Let these words be laced with comfort. And through the silence, speak. Through the silence, speak. Amen. For ministry time today, I feel like we do need to practice being in silence a little bit.